Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar on mathematics and classical education, because mathematics taught classically begins in wonder and builds from those solutions a greater intellectual curiosity about our world. This webinar is being recorded and it will be released via our Thales Press YouTube channel, as well as our Developing Classical Thinkers podcast. Q&A will also follow after uh, Jonathan Gregg's talk, and you can type your questions into the special Q&A box. I would ask that we avoid using the Zoom chat feature unless you're having technical issues of some kind or another. For anyone who does not know me, my name is Winston Brady, and I'm the Dean of Academics and the Director of Thales Press. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Jonathan Gregg, a visiting assistant professor of education at Hillsdale College. By way of a short introduction, Jonathan Gregg regularly teaches classes in mathematics, deductive reasoning, and the quadrivium at Hillsdale College. He's also taught at secondary schools, namely the Great Hearts Charter School System and Hillsdale College's Barney Charter School Initiative. And currently he's pursuing a doctorate in mathematics education from Michigan State University. So without further ado, I'll hand the webinar over to you, Jonathan, to help us learn how mathematics can help us all gain a deeper appreciation and understanding for the beauty, the order, and the harmony in the world around us. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for preparing this talk, and we look forward to learning together with you. Thanks, Winston. <clears throat> um, uh, can everyone hear me? Fantastic. Um, it's, it's an incredible honor to be here with you all. Uh, it's, it really is truly a privilege. Thank you to Thales Press and to uh, Winston for hosting. I think before I begin, the, these kind of events are incredibly important in, uh, I guess, for a couple of reasons. One, just because they're good in and of themselves to come together and to, uh, to share ideas and to think together about things that are meaningful. But two, I think if classical education is going to start gaining a little bit of traction, um, these are the kind of things that um, uh, um, separate something from becoming a, a little flash in the pan from uh, something that actually becomes a legitimate movement where people come together, they share ideas and they build community. And I'm gonna share some ideas that I've thought about today with you. And if you disagree, agree, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to uh, get some pushback. I'd love to get some, um, uh, just just coming together to share ideas I think is really important. So I'm, I'm happy to the 39 of you who have decided on a Thursday afternoon, I want to talk about mathematics pedagogy, uh, which which is uh, I'll try to make that as 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 exciting as I possibly can. And actually, actually, I think mathematics pedagogy is something that as as classical educators or an, and and as students in the classical education um, movement, we need to think about. I think if you think about pedagogy first, um, if you divide this is a poor division, but if you divide a classical school into uh, maybe curriculum culture and pedagogy. I think for classical education, you hear a lot more about curriculum and culture than you ever do about pedagogy, uh, where, um, uh, but I think if we're going to really read these great texts and come together in a way, in a, in, in a culture that values them, we need to teach them and learn them in a way that uh, is deserving of these great texts um, and these great ideas. And then if you combine that with mathematics, um, mathematics is in many ways the place where if you want to look at pedagogy, go to a math classroom uh, or think about what's happening in a math classroom because um, you know, imagine fourth grade mathematics, you don't actually have too much distinctive curricular differences. Uh, you know, you're learning fractions, uh, non-classical school might be learning fractions. Um, and it's the way in which we teach, I think, uh, and the assumptions that we operate with and the way that we bring fractions to life um, and think about fractions and discuss fractions and talk about fractions. That's the kind of thing that that is should be distinctly classical. Um, if you're a, if you're a teacher or a school leader and want to think about pedagogy, think about your math classroom. That's that's kind of a place where you can go. Math is a uh, the subject of mathematics is a revealer of pedagogy often. Um, and so, I think it's actually worth our time to spend some time on mathematics and pedagogy today. Um, and uh, I want to start here with a quote. Um, that I, I ran into about four or five years ago and I have not been able to get out of my head. Um, I, when I was writing this, I wrote down that I was haunted by this quote and then I was trying to think of a different synonym for haunted because haunted doesn't sound good. And then I, 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 you know, it follows me around. I can't get it out of my head. It shows up in interesting places. And I think, yeah, I actually am haunted 
by this quote in, in really the best way possible. It's a quote from Augustine. Uh, it's written in 386, which is right after he, write, he, he, he converts to Christianity. So uh, this is, it's even before he writes the confessions, he writes uh, this treatise that's called On Order. And this is the very first line from On Order. Um, and and um, it goes like this. There is an order to be found within things and between them, which binds and directs this world to attain and retain that order, to open one's eyes and other people's to it is difficult and very uncommon. Um, uh, and I think, uh, I'm, I know I'm only on slide one, but I wanna stop here for just a second and dig into this quote, because I think in some ways, this is the whole ball game uh, when we're talking about mathematics education and mathematics pedagogy here. Uh, so let me unpack that first sentence for a second. There is an order to be found. Okay, so order. Um, you know, we have our order, we often think of it as structure and organization, but I think what Augustine's talking about here is a cosmological order. Um, uh, you might think of this as the musica mundana, the, the, the harmony of the spheres. The um, Stratford Caldecott would call it the secret timber of the cosmos. Uh, if you like Lewis, he would probably call this the deeper magic from the dawn of time. Uh, but this is in some ways a a rhythm and harmony that pervades the entirety of the cosmos, right? The, 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 the underlying structure of our universe, right? Uh, the beat to which our world marches um, the, from the planets down to uh, the atoms, right? Um, I think this is what Augustine has in mind when he talk, he's talking about order. And, and notice the, but it's not just that there is this order, notice the four descriptive words here. First, within things, right? That means it's not, it, it's not just this outside of ourselves order, but it's present inside of us, right? And present inside of everything, right? Not just uh, living things, but inanimate things as well. Um, that there is this, you know, uh, if we talk about the musica mundana, now we have the musica humana, right? The, 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 uh, the human music, that it's not uh, exterior, some sort of exterior set of rules, but these things are present within us. They're ingrained in the beings of the world, right? Uh, that it's not just the world is governed and we're beings that have to deal with that. No, this is in us in some ways, right? And, and then between things, right? So it's, it's not just within us, it's between things. That means in, in relationships between me and my coffee cup, which is filled with water between us, even over this Zoom call, right? Uh, as we're, you could, I like to think of it as this way, right? As, as two beings are approaching each other, you, you can almost feel order sparking between them, um, that, that there's a spark, that there's, and you, you, if you listen closely, you can almost hear it crackle, right? That there are something, the underlying order of the cosmos um, is present when we interact with one another. Uh, that there are certain relationships that uh, are governed by this cosmological order, right? Uh, and then, okay, so, so we have within and between things, but then think about the two active verbs here, right? Uh, which binds and direct the world, right? Um, binds, I think the, you know, sometimes we think about binds as very constrictive, uh, but I think the general idea here is that of unity, where um, binding together, that, that, this part of what unites us as beings in this world is this drum to which to which we um, to which we, to which we march, right? Um, that it's um, you know okay, so there's why do we come together in community? Well, we come together because we've been drawn by something by something that unifies us. And and Augustine's claim here is that is that this is a uniting force. And then directing, again, you have directing can sometimes be a little bit forceful, but the idea I think with directing here is maybe that of a, uh, uh, the director of a play or the director of a symphony, right? That it provides the pattern and the tempo and the guidance and it weaves it together in some sort of a weaving together the disparate parts of life into some sort of seamless whole, right? And I think this is the, you know, this is in some ways an incredibly radical claim for us that there is this secret, you know, it, secret magic really, um, but there is an order that pervades the universe, that there's something objective, that there's something structuring our world, that this isn't, we're not just placed down here randomly. We're not just placed down here with some sort of 
absolute freedom to do what Ever we will, but we're placed down here. We're embedded in a in a in a universe that operates um, under some sort of governing set of principles. Here, let me try to explain for a second how radical this is. Um, and you can go to the next slide here. That there's a um, let me explain. Let me do it by pointing towards progressive mathematics education here. Right, there's a book written in 2000. It's called Where Mathematics Comes From. It's by two cognitive scientists named George Lakoff and Rafael Nunez. Um, and they, um, I got handed this program, or this book actually by a friend, uh, which, which uh, um, and I started reading it and, and you can go to the next slide and it starts beautifully. Um, there's this, um, they posit what they call a romance of mathematics. And I'm, and, I, and I'm, uh, you know, these are some of the tenets of the romance of mathematics here. Number one, mathematics has an objective existence, providing structure to this universe, independent of and transcending the existence of human beings. Number two, mathematical proof allows us to discover transcendental truths of the universe. Number three, mathematics is part of the physical universe and provides rational structure to it. Consider Fibonacci series and flowers, logarithmic spirals, fractals, parabolas, bubbles, pi, right? Uh, um, number four, mathematics characterizes logic and thus structures reason itself. And number five, to learn mathematics is to learn the language of nature. Right? And so I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, yes, I'm going, yes, yes, yes. And you, you could, you could, you could, you could, uh, you could feel the other shoe about to drop here. Um, and I uh, can go to the, go to the next slide, slide, but what they say is that these, uh, well, I can just read it, but the more we have applied what we know about cognitive scientists science to understand the structure of mathematics, the more it has become clear this romance cannot be true. Human mathematics, the only kind of mathematics that human beings know cannot be a subspecies of abstract track transcendent mathematics. Instead, it appears that mathematics as we know it arises from the nature of our brains and our embodied experience. As a consequence, every part of this romance appears to be false for reasons that we'll be discussing. And they go on. Um, and um, this is not some, I'm not cherry picking this from the corners of research in mathematics education. This has 4,500 Google Scholar citations. This is a, this is a central, you know, this is where our society is when it comes to thinking about mathematics. It's that there's no sort of objective existence to mathematics. It's all our own human invention and creativity. Okay. Um, and so what we have is this mathematics turns into what you might call either an individual endeavor or a cultural endeavor uh, or a socio-cultural endeavor where the mathematics that's done is for utility, it's done um, for communication purposes, it's done for uh, it, using primarily human creativity that we're not responding to anything objective, uh, but that it's a subjective thing um, and that we do it differently at, in different times. Uh, and, and we really, if we wanted to call to, if we wanted to say that one plus one is three, that, that, uh, that could be done. Right. Um, and, and, and I think, so you get some idea of how radical this claim that Augustine is making here, um, is, and the, uh, maybe, maybe let me pause for a second. Uh, so. The real issue here that I think when we start thinking about classical education is that Lakoff and Nunez aren't all wrong. Um, they're picking up on something that's fundamentally true in that mathematics is in some ways a human thing. Um, that it does require our imagination. It does require our creativity. It's not just some sort of memorization of facts and regurgitation. That this order in the world requires participation. Um, that it requires our, it, it actually calls out our creativity. And actually, go go to the uh, go to the next slide. Augustine actually recognizes this even as he's discussing on order here. Right? Uh, look at the places that we skipped. There's an order one to be found. That's a human thing. It's our job to find it. Right? Um, and then look at that second sentence. And the, and the great thing about Augustine here right, is that this order is findable. That the order isn't some, it's not a miss, it is mysterious, but it's not a complete mystery to us. That by study, that by working at this, we can come to know the order more and more. Will we ever fully know the order? Probably not. Um, but can we, 
come to know more and more about the order, yeah, we can do so, right? There is a, um, there's a way in which we access, it is, it is accessible in some ways. And then look at that second sentence, number one, to attain and retain that order, right? Uh, to open one's eyes. Um, and then look at the last little bit and other people's to it. This is in some ways of an, an educational task for us. So we're not supposed to just say, okay, yeah, there is this order and it controls our lives. No, it invites us into creativity. It invites us to find it. It invites us to think about it, to retain it, to attain it, to open our eyes and to help other people to open their eyes. Um, this is what the order calls us to do. And so Lakov and Nunez are positing that human mathematics and ordered objective mathematics are in opposition to one another. And what Augustine is saying here is that actually those two things run hand in hand. The more we see mathematics as objective, actually the more subjective we're called to be, the more we're invited to bring our human creativity to, uh, to the understanding of, the retaining of, the figuring out of uh, mathematics. Go, uh, let's see, go to the next slide here. Uh, Augustine is going to continue here. Some, so he talks about what happens when you don't understand order. He calls it disordered opinion. He says, some cauterize the wound of disordered opinion inflicted on them in day-to-day -day life by retreating into solitude. Others do the same by cultivating the liberal arts. And, and I assume since all of you are here with me on Zoom that you're not retreating into solitude, that's probably not the option you've chosen here. Uh, but we have another option. Cultivating the liberal arts is, is the reason why we're here to say that actually the the task here of us is to engage in this cultivation of the liberal arts in order to sort of order ourselves, in order to bring ourselves, this is actually a claim about what it means to be a human being, um, that we, uh, we ought to strive to not to push against the order of the cosmos, right? But to work with the order to understand and bring ourselves into participation with the order or of, of the cosmos, right? Um, let me try one more way of explaining this before I actually get into mathematics pedagogy. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, a fascinating article um, written in 1995 about mathematics education philosophy. Um, and it posits that um, the, uh, you can, if you look at the diagram there, this is by a guy named Paul Ernest, but he posits there are two different kinds of philosophies about what mathematics is. He says there's an absolutist philosophy, meaning that mathematics, it's kind of this Augustinian, if you can think about this, mathematics is ordered, it's structured, it's, it can't be, uh, there are truths in mathematics that are capital T truths that can't be denied, versus a fallibilist philosophy of mathematics, right? Um, and he says that this fallibilist philosophy of mathematics is where mathematics is a human thing. It's a cultural thing. We can do with it what we want. There's nothing objective that they're responding to. And then what he does is he makes the claim that uh, you can see the dark arrows going straight down. He says that absolutist philosophy leads to authoritarian values and an authoritarian view of school mathematics, right? Where I'm going to take my mathematical truths and I'm going to ram them down our throats and we're going to memorize them and we're going to regurgitate them and we're going to test them and we're going to, you know, all of these sort of very rigorous, constrained ways of teaching um, where there's not much room for discussion, et cetera, right? And the fallibilist philosophy leads itself to a humanistic understanding of school mathematics, where if mathematics is this human creation, it lends itself very well to saying, well, what do you want to do? It, you know, what do you think we should do? It's, it's a free for all, right? And it's a very, you can't teach it authoritarian, right? But if you think about classical education and you can see the red arrow that I've drawn here, it's a radical attempt to do something. Uh, Ernest would call this, he calls it crossing over. Um, and he says something like, you, you, I've never actually seen this happen. Um, but classical education is attempting to do, to merge these two things, to say an absolutist philosophy merges itself with a humanistic view of school mathematics, to say that I think that not only is an objective understanding of mathematics true, capital T, but it's actually the most human thing. And we're most human when we start to think about that objective order and when we start to bring ourselves in line with it. Okay, so 
think about the, the classroom now for a second. It's actually very easy to teach purely absolutist, right? Doesn't matter what you think. Mathematics is this way. Here is the truth. Let me give you it in a formula. Let me make you do some practice problems until you get really good at it. Let me ask you to regurgitate it on the test. Very easy. Valdos philosophy, also very easy. Let's get into groups. Here's a good question. Let's think about it. Doesn't really matter what, 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 comes, what really comes out of it, as long as we can communicate well, as long as we can be, uh, you know, it's, it's big into eliciting everyone's ideas and everyone's ideas are as good as everyone else's. And you can say the word for me before every, everything. And that can be a defense against being right and wrong. There is really no right and wrong. And so you know, I think on either side of this, there's some easy pedagogical things. The issue here is how do you teach in a way that both recognizes the absolute truths of mathematics and the world around us and is a, involves human creativity and imagination? If classical education, which is this radical experiment of crossing over, is this kind of thing, how do we do that in the classroom? How do we make that, you know, how do we infuse our classes with that kind of a crossed over life that's both deeply appreciative of the truths of the universe and deeply appreciative of human creativity and imagination that go together in this way? And this is where I think the main mathematics pedagogy classroom or question is here. If we're trying to accompany classical education by a distinctly classical pedagogy, it's that kind of a pedagogy. That's the unique thing that classical education I think has to offer the pedagogy world is it's this combination of absolute fundamental universal human truths that we love and pursue and an understanding of the human being as participatory, as imaginative, as create, creative, right? What's that fusion look like? Okay, so if we go to the next slide, I wanna move into a section trying to answer that question at least a little bit. I wanna do so first by following in the footsteps of the greatest mathematician to ever live for a little bit. This is a guy named Leonard Euler. You can see a little bit of a bio. Uh, if you wanna ask me in the Q and A what you think about, what I think about other mathematicians, you want me to defend Leonard Euler as the goat? I will, uh, but it's really not a debate. He's the greatest of all time. If you wanna come at me with Gauss, okay, okay. You can talk to me about that. He's the greatest of all time, period, full stop. So I wanna walk through what he's doing as a way, not just to appreciate Euler, cause I think that's good, but to come at it with an educational lens to say, what's Euler doing? Um, and how do we follow in that footsteps a little bit in the classroom? Cause I think actually what we get from the life of Euler and the way that he works as a mathematician actually is a pretty decent blueprint for how our mathematics classes should operate. So uh, let me tell you a little story. We can get the next slide here. Uh, you may be familiar with this. This is the Königsberg Bridge problem. Uh, it's 1735. He's reasonably uh, young here, you know, 28, although for a mathematician, that's pretty old. But, but um, uh, this is, um, uh, you know, if you think about uh, one of the more transformative problems in mathematics, it's this, uh, and, and it launched an entire field and multiple fields of mathematics. They're called graph theory. If you haven't seen this problem, it's worth looking up. It's a very cool problem. I think it's pretty understandable. And you can see actually uh, in this picture, um, a map of the city of Königsberg. Um, there are, there's a river that flows into Königsberg. It's from the, from the left here. It splits um, and makes an island and then it leaves on the other side in two different branches, all right? Uh, and you can see it creates kind of four separate land masses here. Uh, they're capital A, B, K, capital B, capital C, capital D here. And in the city of Königsberg, there's seven bridges. Uh, um, you can see them labeled uh, with the lowercase letters here. Um, and the, the legend of the city was that the, the, the challenge of Königsberg was to walk around the city uh, and hit every bridge exactly once. Okay, um, you can try it on your own here. Uh, don't try too long because it's not a possible thing to do. Um, and you can, so Euler visits this city and he pretty quickly says, hey, uh, it's, this is impossible. It's not all that tough to kind of try out a number of the things, but he's not satisfied here. He says, um, and, and I have a quote here, right? Um, 
Uh, Oler says, this question is so banal, uh, but seems to be worthy of attention in that neither geometry nor algebra nor even the art of counting was sufficient to solve it. Um, and so even though you can solve this particular problem, it captures Euler's imagination. Um, and if we see the next slide here, um, he, a year later, writes a paper um, solving the Königsberg bridge problem. Um, and uh, this has launched an entire field of mathematics. So he, he actually treats this as, you know, you can see the model that he uses there. It's a connected graph. You can see the seven bridges in red. Uh, the four land masses are no longer land masses, but they're represented by points. And he basically says, I can, I'll, I'll spoil the ending here. He says, the problem with this is that all of the, uh, all of the bridge, all of the cities, all of the, all of the points on this map have an odd number of bridges connecting to them. And an odd number is problematic because if you're going to try to walk, hit every bridge exactly once, it's gonna strand you in a city, right? So if you, uh, he says, the only times you can walk around is to, is when there's only a maximum of two odd vertices. Um, and so this is the solution and it's, it's true and he publishes this and then he, uh, but this has launched an entire field of, he uh, provides a proof of it, but it's launched an entire field of, of study called graph theory. And um, you can dig into this, this, this a little bit more if you're interested in, but I'm interested specifically here in terms of the pedagogy of what's going on here, right? So let me follow along with, and try to encapsulate what it is that Euler is doing as he's actually doing mathematics. Um, and, and next slide here, the, the first thing that we see from Euler, absolutely number one, is that he's beginning in wonder, right? It's not just that he was wandering around, think about all the citizens of Königsberg who have encountered this problem many, many times. Uh, even some people who've probably said it is impossible, I've tried it, you know, but what Euler is doing is that thing captures his imagination. He's noticing something about the world. He's seeing a truth about the world and it inspires him to say, this is a question. How do we solve this? I can see that it's impossible, but what's the underlying truth of this situation? How does the world operate? Notice how this is a question. He's asking this. He's wondering about this. Number two, uh, uh, we have him then launching into this idea of exploring the problem and using some creativity. So the real piece of creativity here is the picture that you see on your screen right now is the graph that gets drawn. And this is the mathematical move of him. This is the human, the thing, you know, he doesn't get to control whether or not you can operate under, or whether or not you can walk all seven bridges, right? There is a right answer, but notice the human creativity that this is, that I can take this real world situation and model it. I, and mathematics, this is one of our main endeavors here that we do, that we do, excuse me, all the time. Mathematics is this art of modeling, art of finding ingenious solutions. Think about just the regular way that we add and subtract numbers, um, that we line them up in, we talk about numbers in place value language, that we line them up, that we group the place values, and then that we exchange things. We don't get to control whether 17 plus 24 is equal to 41, but there are different ways I can solve that, right? I could start with 24 and say 25, 26, 27, 28. I can get real caveman and say, let me go get 24 rocks over here and 17 rocks over here and push them together and then count them up. Right? This, there's a reason why mathematics moves forward is that we are interested in inventing things and um, exercising our human imagination and creativity. Um, and, and, and you can see a huge example of this. And oh, let's look at number three as a step here. Finally, then he gets to a solution, all right? Uh, he says, it is impossible for this reason. Here's my proof. Um, it's, you know, here you can try it out. The real issue is this. And then number four here, he takes that individual solution and he looks to generalize it. And he looks to say, okay, 
What about if I removed a bridge? Then could I do that one? What if I built a new bridge? Then could I do that one? When is a graph, when is a series of bridges and rivers solvable? What is the formula here that I can say, don't just take that individual solution, that individual truth, but let's think about it. Let's think about all the different possible combinations. Let's think about it in, in general. Um, and then notice what happens at the very end here is now we think about, okay, it, this general solution stimulates us to wonder one more time um, that we're asking new questions to say, what if, and this is where the whole field of graph theory shows up to say, what if we wanted to hit every bridge exactly once and start and end in the same place? What if we wanted to hit every landmass exactly once? What if we wanted to hit every landmass exactly once and every bridge exactly once? Where we're, our human minds then re-wonder, right? We're stimulated once again to wonder at the very end. And I think if we look at the life of Euler and X, if we look at the life of a lot of mathematicians, this is the way mathematics is supposed to work. Wonder, exploration, solution, generalization. However, look at the way our pedagogy works almost always. It almost always operates the exact inverse. I right, think about, you know, let me look at the, let me walk you through the exact inverse, right? Start with, here's a formula, right? Here's your generalization. Go solve a bunch of problems. Oh, by the way, you should maybe draw a picture to illustrate that. Isn't this a fun thing, guys? Like, it's four, three, two, one, the way we teach a lot of times, where we say, we start with the end, we start with the formula, we say, here you go, here's a formula. And it robs us of the real move that Euler is thinking about here, right? Where, and, and notice how this is, the way that Euler's thinking about this is actually the perfect combination of objectivity and, and, and human creativity, of order and imagination, where he, understands that the universe operates under certain principles and that it's his job to figure those things out and to illuminate them and to better characterize them where number number three and four here he's not you know this is where we see him just appreciate the objectivity and the order of the universe but one and two are much more human than we give it than we often give mathematics credit for um, that we bring our imagination and we bring our creativity to it so I actually think, this is what I think, you know, if we walk ourselves through Euler's footsteps and we get something like this, but I think this is actually provides us a decent map to what a classical lesson shape or what can be done in a classical classroom. Um, so let me actually see if I can map, you know, following Euler's footsteps, map on what mathematics pedagogy is supposed to look like. And then maybe at the end, I'll try to illustrate this with a real example of what it might look like in the classroom. So if we go to the next slide, number one, I think in the classroom, we're supposed to begin with some sort of an opening question that reveals some unknown and marvelous problems. Notice actually, there's this beautiful equivocation that we do on the word wonder, right? Wonder has two meanings. Number one, it means that it's supposed to be marvelous, but number two, it means that it's supposed to be unknown. We wonder, at something that's incredibly beautiful and we wonder at something that we don't know right? we use this it's just in, as a semantic point here right we are we equivocate on the word wonder um, and so it is in the unknown that we um that we start to actually be moved to creativity right it's this it's the placing of a problem in front of students that they don't know how to do uh that's wonderful that's you know that's embedded in the truth of the world and requires some creativity to solve right if you're beginning your mathematics class with a formula we're doing it wrong right not that we want to eliminate formulas or get rid of formulas right but formulas aren't the beginning of the way mathematics works right we don't just spoon feed the results of mathematics to ourselves and our students right it's not like a, let's take all the real mathematics, put it in a blender, grind it up, and here's the result, and here's a formula. Let's practice the problems. It's not how we do it. We have to start with an opening question. In the same way that a lot of our literature discussions start with a similar thing, or what's a driving question of what's going on here? Number two, 
exploration and creativity, where this, I think, is the heart of the, the mathematics class, where after this opening question, we elicit some student thinking, right? We elicit some follow, we elicit, and right, we say, what are the potential answers students could give to this? And as teachers, we press on them and we say, why do you think that? Why might that make sense? What about this? So these follow-up questions that we are able to say, and we're starting to get into this, you know, it's not just that any student answer is as good as every other one, right? But that these answers are meant to be tugged and pulled on until we start to move towards a real answer, right? Where, you know, if I gave you that bridge question, maybe at a, a and, and I said, what's the problem with this? Why is this graph? Why can't I walk through this town and another town I could walk? And you'd say, well, maybe I see there's seven bridges. Maybe the problem is that there's a, uh, there's a prime number of bridges. And then we might ask a follow-up question and say, well, what if there's, what if, uh, I, what about this graph with two bridges? Can I walk through all those bridges? And you can say, Oh yeah, so the prime number might not be the real issue here, where it's this discussion, it's the follow-up questions, it's the, it's the, it's the, you know, I've got a lot of student ideas and I'm pushing on those, right? And then number three here, we have this, um, some sort of a, we're, as the class is moving forwards, we finally arrive at a moment when truth actually becomes clear, right? And here's where we start to get at some sort of insight. This isn't where our classes start, but we, we're interested in this discovery of the truth of the world. We're pruning all of our ideas to figure out which ones are the, which ones are the great ones, right? What's the real truth here? And then number four, now we get into something where we want to actually prove our formulas. We want to practice our problems. We want to work through our nuances. Like once we come to some understanding about, we want to think through definitions. We want to be rigorous about this truth and working it out, but we do it in such a way that we arrive at the truth and then work it out. We don't begin there, right? We think about where progressive pedagogy is headed. It's the top two, maybe the top one and a half of this pieces, right? It's a great question and it's a lot of student thoughts, but there's no real underlying truth to press towards, right? And if you think about maybe the, the opposite of progressive, I don't know, you might call it hyper-classical or something like this, right? It starts at three and it just says, here's the truth about the world, like it or not, I'm gonna give it to you and repeat after me, right? But what we're doing, I think in real classical pedagogy is the fusion of both of those, right? It's this wonderful opening question. It's this Socratic discussion with follow-up questions, some back and forth, some discussion, but then it's an arrival at truth and it's a working out of the truth. So let me do an example really quickly. Um, I saw a question pop up in the chat. I know I'm not supposed to be looking at the chat, but I saw one pop up like, oh, hey, that seems really nice in a 612 environment. What about a K-5 environment? I'm gonna pick a first grade example. Uh, I can do it for 10th grade or 11th grade if you want, but let's think about a first grade example. How does this look in a first grade classroom? Okay, so pretend I'm teaching about what, what is multiplication? Okay, this is my topic for the day. I could start at three. I could say multiplication is the addition of repeated or addition of like groups, right? But no, let's start at one. Opening question, which is easier to figure out how many fingers we have in this class or to figure out how many pets we have as a class? It's my opening question. Okay, so. I haven't mentioned multiplication at all. This is a real world question. This is a human question. This is a, it's a wonder thing. We don't know the answer, right? I'm gonna get multiple student responses. Some people might say pets, some people might say fingers, right? And I'm gonna ask them some follow-up questions. Why do you think pets? Why do you think fingers? Pets, you know, there's some real good examples about why, why pets might be the answer here, right? Pets, there are fewer of them, right? We have more fingers than we have pets probably, unless there's a bunch of people float with like 11 goldfish, like in the class probably we have more figures than pets um but then we'll the exploration idea is let's try it out right so let's work on this together let's try it let's explore let's use our creativity let's say okay pets how many pets do you have how do we do this how many pets do you have how many pets do you have we have to figure out how many pets everyone has put them on the board add them all up we can get an answer we do the same thing for fingers right we say how many figures do you have how many fingers do you have? Do I, do I need to ask everyone how many fingers they have? I don't. What do I need to do? 
to count how many people are in the class. I don't actually need to know how many fingers everyone has. I know that piece. The only thing I need to know is how many fingers one person has and how many people there are. And so in some ways you see that's different than the pet scenario. It's a different, and this is where we start to get at the truth. This is step three, that in the cosmos, there are addition things, there are addition -y things, and there are multiplication things, right? Where, you know, and you can ask your students, what's like this? What's, what's the same as fingers? And they'd say toes or ears. And you say, what's something that's non-human body related? You might say, but wheels on a car maybe, right? How many wheels are on 15 cars? It's not really an addition thing. I don't need to do the addition that I'm used to. And so this truth of the world is that in the cosmos, there are, there are addition-y type things where everyone has, there's different amounts and there's multiplication things. And the reason why we develop multiplication is not because, is because we're responding to something in the cosmos, right? And then with step four, you can actually move in to say, okay, here's what multiplication is. Now I know the things that we care about with multiplication how many are in one group and how many groups you have, right? Groups times how many in a group is multiplication. You've arrived there and now you can give them a definition. You can do practice problems. You can figure out what happens if I multiply, you know, down the road, what happens if I multiply three numbers together, right? How does multiplication work? You have all of these working through of nuances, but notice you see this move through where it's, it's actually a pedagogical strategy of moving from wonder all the way towards truth where you've done this amazing fusion of human creativity and imagination with um, a belief that the cosmos is ordered and structured and has beauty to give, okay? Um, and I think this is the kind of pedagogy that we need to be striving for in classical schools, mainly because it lines up with the philosophies that undergird classical education. And I think it lines up with how we understand the human being. Let me finish with a couple of quotes for you. Um, uh, yes, uh, sorry. And then, right, the, the, the wonder arrow comes, comes back through. But let me finish with a couple of quotes. Um, number one, this is another one that haunts me. I haven't been able to get this one out of my mind. It's, it's, it's by uh, uh, an author named Annie Dillard called, uh, she writes a book called Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Um, actually, if you think about the um, beginning quote from Augustine where he said, some cauterize the wound by retreating into solitude. Dillard actually does retreat into solitude. This is her meditations from a retreat into nature. But she says the following. She says, I walk out. I see something, some event that would otherwise have been utterly missed and lost. Or something sees me. Some enormous power brushes me with its clean wing. And I resound like a beaten bell. Notice the enormous power and my resounding. This is the fusion of of the human and the ordered, right? Uh, and she, notice how she describes her response. I am an explorer then, and I'm also a stalker or the instrument of the hunt itself. Certain Indians used to carve long grooves along the wooden shafts of their arrows. They called the grooves lightning marks because they resembled the curved fissure lightning slices down the trunks of trees. Um, on the next slide, I've got actually a picture of some of these lightning marks, right? Grooves down the arrows. She says, the function of the lightning marks is this. If the arrow fails to kill the game, blood from a deep wound will channel down the lightning mark, streak to the arrow shaft, spatter to the ground, laying a trail dipped on broad leaves on stones that the barefoot and trembling archer can follow into whatever deep or rare wilderness it leads. And this is the thing that I can't get out of my head. I am the arrow shaft carved along my length by unexpected lights and gashes from the very sky. And this book is my straying trail of blood. She's talking about writing her book, but I think actually we could be easily talking about mathematics and science here, right? Notice the world is meant for us to be shaped by, right? You can imagine yourself being carved, right? It's a, it's a physical and, you know, I'm moved by the world, right? But then what I do, and, and I think if you had to give me a, a, it's a weird image of what a teacher does, but I think it's one of the best images I've ever come across. It's this teacher as an arrow, striking out into the world, piercing the world, right? And then leaving some sort of a trail for students to follow. And, this, and, and if you're a student listening, right? Follow, your job is to follow that trail, right? To, to explore, to launch out, right? To, to, you know, 
see the one, you know, if a teacher is bringing something wonderful, some sort of an opening question that's actually stimulating, have some ideas, have some discussion, follow that trail, right? We're not just, you know, again, it's not as teachers, we don't just say, I killed this deer, I carved it up, here's my prepackaged thing, you know, take this venison home with you. That's not what we're doing, we're hunting. And we actually, as teachers, are the instrument of the hunt itself. Students, you're hunting, right? It's a pursuit. Um, can't get this image of, of the, the lightning marked arrows out of my head. Let me try one last quote here. Uh, this is a guy by Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um, he's, a, he's a more modern uh, Catholic theologian. Um, writes a book called Theologic, which is, I think, a, very similar to Augustine's in my mind, where he's trying to think about this idea of how does the objectivity of the world and the creativity of our humanity go, go hand in hand. And he says, the whole world of images that surrounds us is a single field of signification. Every flower we see is an expression. Every landscape has its significance. Every human or animal face speaks its wordless language. Now, the fact that the same things can surround us day after day, appear before us every morning with the same existence and essence, but not become unendurable is due to the mysteriousness of truth which is always richer than we have been able to apprehend so far. Um, next slide. Uh, even when we have known a thing, it remains in a sense inexplicable, thus compelling us to look up to it with reverent veneration, sure that it is capable of further revelation, that its inner wealth has the capacity to go on infinitely irradiating new truth. I think this is central to what we're doing as classical educators because it's an understanding of the world as capable of irradiating new truth always, right? That it's truth is not just this objective thing that we've figured out, but it's an objective thing that is infinitely deep and it's never gonna be exhaustible. And our job as human beings is to continue to pursue that to continue to look to it, to believe that the world is capable of revelation and to pursue it. And I think if we're thinking about what's at the heart of mathematics, it's this pursuit. And so if we're thinking about a kind of pedagogy, a kind of way we teach and learn in the classroom, it needs to mirror the, this way of thinking about what mathematics is and what are, we are as human beings. And I think it's this idea of wonder, exploration, arrival at truth, and then some sort of working out of truth. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy to come up with those kinds of questions. It's not easy to go through the exploration. Um, it's way easier to teach math as either a progressive or a hyper-classical way of doing it. It's a difficult endeavor, um, but I think if we start to think about what mathematics pedagogy looks like, it has to be something along these lines. Um, thank you all for um, uh, showing up and being here, or if you're listening later, listening later, happy to talk to you about any of these ideas or to, um, I mean, the real question that I'm leaving us with is the question of how to say, okay, now give me another topic. Give me 11th grade Riemann sums. Give me 12th grade Riemann sums. How do you do that? Uh, how do you teach it that way? But I think what, if we have this shape um, and this understanding that we're approaching with our pedagogy with, that's the fun part, to figure out how to teach specific things um, and how this starts to work out. Um, but if we're trying to start to think about what a classical shape looks like, what a real classical mathematics pedagogy looks like, in my mind, it looks something like this. Well, Jonathan, thank you. Like this was such a great way to start the school year, but uh, as a philosophy, philosophy teacher, humanities teacher, um, I mean, this is this really brings joy to my soul hearing you talk about how we as human beings are capable of not only pursuing truth, um, we can comprehend it, you know, a little bit. It is infinite and our, our minds are limited and finite, but it brings just an incredible and resounding joy once we have confidence, you know, that the world around us has this order that we really need. We really need those true, true things in order to live lives that are full of purpose and meaning and joy. We, it's 3.51, so we've got some time for questions. 
And uh, generally we give a few minutes just for people to type in uh, into the Q&A box uh, your questions. I can see two in there already. Um, I'm gonna give uh, preference to the people that have already asked uh, questions. And then uh, Jonathan, maybe if we have time, you can walk us through that diagram of how Leonard uh, Euler actually solved the Konigsberg bridge problem. I, uh, if you saw me looking over to the side, I was trying to, you know, can you go start there? Go there? No, okay. But uh, I would love to hear how he was able to do that. Uh, I mean, just the whole way through is just fascinating. Um, we can start off, um, I'm sure most people here are familiar with the quadrivium, right? The four ways of um, the four roads, uh, including astronomy, music, geometry, and arithmetic. And our first question here is just classical pedagogy in mathematics. In the ancient world, there was more of a strong connection between say, um, astronomy, music, geometry, arithmetic, all, the, all those sorts of things. Um, you brought up the music of the spheres uh, in Ptolemy. And uh, here, you know, if we're really going to revive this classical understanding of teaching mathematics, um, should we learn to think of math in terms of music and astronomy again? Or are those fields somehow anachronistic to the study of math today. Jonathan, can you see the Q&A on your screen too? Yes, I can, for sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's a really good question. And um, the, uh, if you, it's especially an interesting question when you think about it as the um, um, sort of an ordered, if you think about the quadrivium as holding some sort of place in the preparation of, of a human person. Of, uh, so if we think about um, education is this, is this preparation, you know, what does the quadrivium as an idea do for the human person? Um, and why might we study it sort of traditionally after the trivium? Where um, if we think about the trivium as, you know, grammar, logic, and rhetoric here, these are, if uh, vastly oversimplification, so uh, if, if uh, I could go into a lot uh, uh, on this, but um, oversimplifying them, thinking about the trivium as these sort of human arts or the arts of the word, right? Uh, so you have grammar, logic, and rhetoric. These are human things. Um, in some ways, these are things that we have a lot of control over, um, that logic a little less, uh, but um, in, in many ways, this is a uh, they're language developing things um, that they teach us how to communicate well, how to participate in reading and writing and engaging with, um, you know, engaging with ideas, right? But then what we see the step towards the quadrivium, right? And, and notice in the, uh, let me give you a full shape of the, of the progression here. At the top of this tower is usually philosophy and theology um, as sort of the you know, where you go after the liberal arts, right? They, they often stand on the pinnacle of the liberal arts tower. Um, the, there's also an, a bunch of other arts that I think are, are worth, worth thinking about as well, um, you know, law, et cetera, right? But if you think about just the liberal arts, the quadrivium, so why does, what does the quadrivium do here, right? If we think about what ties together arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music, right? These things are necessarily, right, these, are, these are the arts of the word, these are the arts of the world, right? Where we don't have control over these types of things. These are arts that are outside of ourself, right? These are the human things. These are the outside, you know, this is us, you know, if you think of the trivium, this is oversimplifying again, but you think of the trivium as we're being shaped in our little human cocoon. The quadrivium is us emerging and exploring the world, right? To say, Arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music are these ways in which we can see the world around us. And we take our human, uh, our individual, our arts of the word, and we're forced to engage with something outside of ourselves, right? something larger than us, something bigger than us, something that we both share with other people. Um, there's a great, uh, there's a great word that if you've never, or I guess it's two words, but um, uh, it's this idea of a theoanthropocosmic synthesis. I'll say that word, it's theoanthropocosmic synthesis, right? Theo, right, uh, God, anthropo world, uh, sorry, anthropo human cosmic world, right? That there's this human 
you know, part of the way we have to think about this is that somehow hand in hand, us as individual beings, the world around us and our relationship to the divine have some sort of relationship here. And how do we think about the relationship between those things? And in the liberal arts, this idea of the quadrivium is this launch out into the world around us. It's a way to get outside of ourselves. I think it's particularly important in modernity where, uh, um, you know, the human or the cultural has, that bubble has grown too large. Um, and so the quadrivium represents this move outwards. And so I think uh, thinking about the question, the real place, the real value, I think, in, in tying arithmetic geometry to astronomy and music is that all of those things force us to think of ourselves as present within some sort of larger ordered world, right? And so the more we can tie, uh, the more we can let that, um, that be the undergirding principle when we're doing math and science, right? And even if you think about, I mean, even think about some of the modern sciences that we do, biology, chemistry, physics, et cetera, right? Again, this is, I, I would actually think those would fall in line with some of the quadrivial principles here where you're, you know, the world operates via some sort of structure and it's our job to discover it. And it's our job to, pre to, to, to press it further, right? Where, and so I think tying not just math into this. So the real value of this question, I think, um, is the fact that all four of those things, and in some ways music as well, um, definitely a, a more complex understanding uh, question in modernity, but um, in many ways, the, if we can teach our math and our science with the same sort of understanding that this is a, um, it's us bringing our humanity to try to discover and understand the cosmological order that we are uh, surrounded by. I think that's the real connection and the value that I'm seeing where we would want to study, um, we'd want to look for those types of connections and look for those types of overlaps that, um, that are going to, you know, where, uh, okay, this is, let me, let me take this one more step further, right? Uh, if we think about integration between disciplines, often we think about it on a surface level where we say, um, you know, think about the integration of disciplines of English and history, right? Maybe I want to read things from the same time period um, or study the history of the time period at the same time I'm reading some text from that. Okay, that, that's good integration. I don't think that's a bad thing. But integration happens, I think, on this sort of subterranean level as well, where it's what human questions are approached by multiple subjects at the same time. And so I think when we sort of think about the connections between um, astronomy and math or music and math, it's you can do them across, you know, there's certainly vibrations in music and um, the mathematics of those is incredibly fascinating. You know, that's a surface level connection that I think should be made, but the deeper connection where we wanna study these things together is we wanna study them in terms of how do they both give us the chance as human beings to get outside of ourselves and to explore the cosmos as this source of revelation. And that I think is where we start to get real, where I see some of the real value in fusing, uh, you know, math and biology or math and music or biology and music where, where we're getting at it, how we understand the world and the human person. And, and really the integration there is, are the, the links that we don't often do. Right? We, we often integrate kind of surface level um, and call that good, right? W which is not a bad thing. In integration between disciplines, seeing those connections is always good. Um, but the real value, I think, is this understanding what the quadrivium as a, as a discipline, as a set of disciplines does for the human per person in that it gets us outside of ourselves and it really prepares us for the disciplines of philosophy and theology. Um, last comment there. Uh, with 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 one second, uh, you know, if you read something like the Consolation of Philosophy, um, and notice throughout the entire thing, it's filled with quadrivial references. Right, the first place they go, right, it, philosophy does is she says, "Look at the world around you. Look at the world around you." This is what philosophy does in that the personification of philosophy does in that book. She consistently points to the quadrivium. Well, Jonathan, I think we have time for one more question. 
Um, before I turn the microphone over to you, I just want to invite our attendees uh, for our next upcoming webinar. On February 8th, we're hosting Richard Vetter, who's the Distinguished Professor Emeritus at Ohio University. And we're talking about American greatness and preparing for the future. You know, we're so blessed to live in the United States. This is the land of opportunity. And uh, Dr. Vetter is going to be walking through ways in which um, the United States has set itself apart as that unique place of opportunity and how students can prepare for a future to meaningfully contribute to the world that we live in. So I would love for people to join us for that webinar. Um, February 8th, uh, we'll send a link in our, uh, we'll have send a follow-up email once this webinar, the recording, the video and everything is up and running. Uh, but Jonathan, I thought it'd be great if you could end uh, just giving us your elevator pitch for why Leonard uh, Euler is the greatest <laughs> mathematician in compare, uh, compared to Shankatala Devi and uh, Shervasi Ramanujan, um, founders of the properties of the partition function. Would you kind of give your elevator pitch for why <laughs> Leonard Euler, Euler uh, may be the best mathematician, especially in relationship to the two individuals um, that are uh, one of our attendees uh, asked you about? Yeah, the, the Ramanujan one is a, is, is a, is a good, that, that's, uh, he's definitely up there uh, as, as, a, uh, as a candidate. Um, I, so I, I do really appreciate that question. Um, certainly, um, certainly in the more modern, uh, yeah, uh, definitely up there with Gauss for sure. The, I think for Euler, um, one of the things that I love about reading or, or thinking about what, what Euler's doing is it strikes me that a lot of what he does is this um, is a real creative twist on what's um, what's been done in the past, where we see him opening up avenues and branches of mathematics, not just kind of taking a question and kind of brute force press. I mean, you could think of someone like Andrew Wiles, uh, who's a phenomenal mathematician, but taking a single problem and just dedicating his life to it. Um, and and um, what I think we see from Euler is this, uh, um, the the new where, where he takes something that's kind of appears to be simple and he says there's a depth here that we that 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 we can think about and we can do so in 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 this way where a lot of um a lot of what Euler's ideas tend to be are are um this uh you know I mean the the, the Königsberg bridge problem is a, is probably the most accessible example where it's a deceptively simple idea that he just um, there's no other way to explain it than just pure brilliance that he's able to say let's try it this way and it's that move that I think is just makes me really love Euler the other thing that I really love about Euler too um, there's a there's actually a um, at the very end of his life he um, he actually wrote a uh, an algebra textbook, like a very, it's almost, it's, it, it's an incredibly accessible textbook uh, on pretty elementary mathematics. And I think for Euler as a mathematician, he's not just brilliant, but he's very interested in asking the fundamental human questions and saying, what's our, what are some of the first principles that are at play here? And his explanations of those things, I think are, are, um, are present throughout his work where he's not seeking to be obscure in mathematics, but he's seeking to be relatable, um, and he's seeking to make the truth of the world not not less accessible, but more accessible. I think sometimes mathematicians can be this uh, can be uh, you know strive for complexity, and I think what Euler is doing is really certainly in willing to delve deeply and complexly, but striving for simplicity. Right? He's interested in that. Uh, and that I think is really what mathematics is about. So uh, I, I could, I could definitely deserves a longer conversation, but that's the elevator pitch. All right. Well, Jonathan, we can't thank you enough for your time and all the effort that you put into this presentation. Uh, this was fascinating to hear from um, just the ways in which mathematics can give us certainty about the world that we live in, you know, that it's not random and chaotic. Um, 
I love the analogies that you use of being like a hunter, going out in pursuit of the truth and then infinitely irradiating it out. You know, these are wonderful things for all of us as classical educators to really meditate on. And so as, you know, for me, this is really the best time of the year. It's the beginning of a new quarter. I, I'm just so encouraged and, and, and frankly inspired uh, before you know I step into the classroom on Monday. So I can't thank you enough for your time and all the effort that you put into this presentation. Thanks, Winston. This is super fun. Super. Uh, uh, thanks for thanks for encouraging me to put this all together. So thanks. All right, we'll go ahead and end the webinar now. So thank you guys so much. And uh, like I said, just please email me if I can be of any help to you guys. All right, you guys have a great day. See you all.